Welcome everyone, I'm Michelle Kaus, Director of Business Development with Rogers Behavioral Health, and I'm your moderator for today's webinar. Joining me today is Dr. Jerry Halverson, Rogers Behavioral Health Chief Medical Officer, and Dr. Brenda Bailey, Clinical Supervisor of OCD and Anxiety Services for Adults, who is based at Rogers Oconomowoc Campus. Before we get started, I just wanna give a quick overview of the format. The webinar is scheduled for 90 minutes. There is no need to check in. To receive CE credits, you must be logged into the webinar for the entire program. The PowerPoint slides and references will be available after the program via an email sent from CEGO. In addition, a recording of the webinar will be published on the resources section of our website within the next day or two for you to rewatch. Doctors Bailey and Halverson will give a 70 to 75 minute presentation. Following the, their presentation, I will facilitate a Q&A session. If you would like to ask our presenters a question during the presentation, please use the Q&A button, not the chat button to send me a message. At the bottom of your screen, you will simply click the Q&A button on the Zoom taskbar. I will review the question submitted then the presenters will address those during the Q&A portion of the webinar. Now I'll turn it over to our presenters. Good afternoon. So we will start with uh, no disclosures uh, of, of interest. And I will let you know that Dr. Bailey is driving. So you're gonna hear me saying next slide a, a fair bit. Um, our learning objectives are uh, as, as follows that you see up on the screen. Next, please. And, you know, basically what we're going to cover uh, in this webinar uh, is uh, first I'm going to talk about uh, COVID-19's impact on, on mental health uh, in this country. Uh, we'll start uh, with some data uh, from earlier in the year and, and we'll have some data that uh, gets us to December. Uh, and because uh, I think that's important, it's important for us to understand, um, you know, obviously we see it every day, uh, but it's really nice to see it in, in front of us. And it's important to understand what people are bringing into the office space. Uh, and that's basically what I'm going to talk about. Uh, and then Dr. Bailey uh, will follow up uh, with an overview of the manifestations uh, and the treatments and some modifications. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Uh, so, you know, I started out uh, with, uh, you know, we've been calling this the se second pandemic uh, uh, within our system uh, because clearly uh, we are working uh, with COVID like everybody else is and in, in trying to manage that within a, a large uh, system. Uh, but also we're seeing this, this intensive uh, increase uh, in, in need for, for mental health care. And, and most of you noticed, and I'm putting Milwaukee uh, area up here, uh, because that's the that's the home area of our of our hospital based units. But I know this is true in other parts of the country. But according uh, to our Department of Health, there was already a mental health crisis that was growing in the Milwaukee area uh, with 5000 more crisis calls recorded in 2019 and 2015. And I know that there is similar data for Los Angeles and other other large, large countries and uh, cities. And I do know uh, that uh, certainly that has been this feeling of a, of a crescendoing uh, type of uh, increase in need for mental health treatment. And, and then we have the pandemic. Uh, please, next slide. Your next, next story. Uh, according to the Kaiser Family Foundation, 53% of adults uh, in the US in July reported that COVID negatively affected their mental health. Um, of those, 36% uh, uh, endorsed trouble sleeping, 32% uh, endorsed difficulty eating. 12% uh, in endorsed increased substance use and 12% uh, in uh, endorsed worsening psychiatric concerns. I think one of the pieces to keep in mind here, and this is the first time I'm gonna mention it, but certainly not the last time, uh, COVID has absolutely uh, taken people that have current uh, psychiatric concerns and you know led to relapse or led to exacerbations, but certainly uh, it is also, we'll find um, that, that a lot more uh, than 12% of our population is endorsing uh, these symptoms now uh, that, we're, uh, that we're in COVID. Next slide, please. 
And this is a, a graphic that you know we shared with our uh, medical staff and the rest of our staff uh, earlier this year. Um, the CDC, and then I'll be using a lot of CDC uh, data that we'll talk about pretty soon. Uh, in late June, 40% of US adults uh, reported struggling with mental health or substance abuse. And you know, we're really gonna concentrate on anxiety and depression symptoms, really focusing in on the anxiety piece as it as it surrounds the workplace. Uh, but in general, uh, almost a third uh, of our over a quarter of, of people uh, are reporting symptoms. And as you know, uh, depression and anxiety are common, uh, and they've been common for a long time, but not that common. Um, also, we're seeing people that are starting or increasing substance use. I know in our treatment facilities, we have certainly seen that. We have seen an increase of relapse. It's a very common story to hear from one of our one of my patients uh, that they were doing well. Uh, and then at the beginning of COVID, uh, things got more intensive uh, and they, they relapsed or being stuck at home versus being in the office made it a little bit too tempting, um, being virtual made it easier uh, to easier to relapse. And, and I think all of those things you've probably seen in your practice is also trauma or stressor related disorder symptoms uh, are, are, are more common, uh, commonly reported now. Uh, and also, and I think one of the important pieces, we're not going to spend a, a great deal of time on this. Uh, but as far as the percentage of patients seriously considering suicide, 11% is a huge number, uh, as you know. And I know in our system, we have seen uh, uh, an uptick in our in our area, particularly in in the uh, Madison or in the Milwaukee, um, Midwestern Wisconsin Illinois area. We are definitely seeing uh, an increase uh, in suicide attempts. People coming in. Uh, with suicidal ideation and basically the acuity uh, overall has been has been quite increased. Uh, next slide, please. I'm going to use the uh, CDC Household Pulse Survey. Uh, it's a really nice survey. I don't know if you've heard about it. I'm going to talk about it a little bit, and I'm going to use that as as a lot of uh, to to underline a lot of what I'm what I'm talking about uh, as far as uh, what our uh, you know what the data is out there. Uh, it's the Center for Disease Control National Center for Health Statistics. Uh, it's an online survey uh, that was given that is given out on an ongoing basis to rapidly respond and provide relevant data. So it's really it's really a great opportunity to take a temperature, to take a pulse, I guess, of what's going on uh, in in the U.S. Uh, the assessment measures are measures that you've heard of, the PHQ-2 and the GAD-2. The idea isn't necessarily to take a deep dive, but the idea is to get more people to fill it out to make it easy. So that's what they've done. Uh, they conducted it in three phases, April through July, August through October, and then October through December. Uh, next slide, please. You know, since uh, since COVID, um, there the uh, household pulse survey suggests that the proportion of U.S. adults with anxiety and depression has quadrupled since the coronavirus pandemic began, and we're going to talk about that specifically uh, with the burden disproportionately borne by women and people of color. Uh, we're going to talk about some of the reasons why that might be uh, in a little bit too. Uh, the pulse survey also suggested accessing care in the U.S. has worsened. Um, as evidenced by uh, nearly one quarter of adults in early November reporting that they have not received needed care. Now, of course, not receiving care is potentially uh, you know, a different issue than, than limited access to care. There's obviously a lot of things that go into this. Uh, there are choices uh, that patients are making uh, as far as you know, being worried about treating, you know, going to get care uh, and getting sick so they avoid care or uh, maybe not prioritizing care over other things. Uh, there are certainly also been, and we'll talk about this in our area, there have been mental health facilities uh, that had decreased the number of mental health patients that they would take care of in order to focus more on COVID patients. So uh, there, there are a lot of reasons um, that the access is down, but we do know, and this is not just psychiatry, we do know that people are accessing uh, treatment less. Now, uh, we do have telemedicine and telemedicine, as we'll talk about in a little bit, has been really great for uh, enhancing access in some uh, areas, but there are still providers as well as patients that aren't interested in telemedicine and telemedicine doesn't work for everyone. And, and we'll, we'll get into that uh, also in a little bit. Next slide, please. 
So this is a, a big, busy, busy graph. Um, but since we're going to look at a couple of these, I'm going to take a little bit of time to orient you to it. So this is uh, from the CDC Household Pulse Survey. Uh, this is available on the website. It's it's really a nice, uh, it's it's really nice, and it really gives you an idea of of what's been going on. I'm just showing you right here uh, the indicators of anxiety or depression. So it's more of a general. Uh, more of a general uh, picture of a reported frequency of symptoms during the last seven days. So that is the question that people are being asked, uh, these symptoms within the past seven days. It, you know, I'd like you to take a look at, um, you know, you see there's uh, September on one side and December on the other side. And uh, on the, uh, on the, um, and then on, on the axis over here, uh, there's age, there's gender, there's race and, and ethnicity uh, that'll give you kind of a sense of how things are going. And, and I will tell you overall, the trends that we see here uh, is that things have been worsening. Um, if you might remember, September for a lot of places uh, was actually a, um, you know, maybe a little bit of a respite. Uh, I think Wisconsin was starting to, to, to pick up, uh, but I think a lot of other places were doing okay uh, during that period of time and even then, uh, you know, if you look at the younger age groups, 18 to 29, you still had almost uh, over half of, of, uh, of people were endorsing uh, that they were having uh, these symptoms. And now this isn't necessarily I have depression or I have an anxiety disorder. Again, this is just symptoms. And if you take a look, uh, even going back to September, there is this differentiation uh, between uh, the, um, uh, the, the, the prevalence in Hispanic and Latino and non-Hispanic uh, black single race uh, versus uh, white non-Hispanic single races. So, so even at that time, and we can, again, there's a lot of reasons for that as far as uh, when we get into essential workers uh, and who's at work and who's at home. Uh, but, but even when things were relatively quiescent, uh, these trends were there and, and the, struggles, uh, the, the struggles were clear. Although again, I think it's interesting, you look at the the uh, older age groups and the numbers are are low, and I know we spend a lot of time very concerned uh, about about them uh, getting getting sick uh, with what's going on. But obviously, we're more concerned about it than they are, um, it seems. Uh, but looking at our most recent data that we have, our December data, the couple things that I wanted to point out to you is that the prevalence for anxiety or depression based on these is is over forty percent. Uh, for uh, for everybody that's responding uh, to this. And I also want to point out that uh, our young adults are 18 to 29. Uh, the number almost goes up to 60%, uh, which is uh, obviously very concerning. And, and these are uh, are really our working, uh, you know, kind of peak working times. Uh, so I think it's really important uh, to, to, to point that out. And about, again, by gender, there's definitely a difference between female and male that are endorsing these symptoms. And looking uh, at the race and ethnicity in this general anxiety and depression bucket, uh, you are continuing to see that there is a differentiation uh, between uh, Hispanic or Latino uh, and non-Hispanic Black single race. Uh, and so, so what I kind of want us to see here uh, are those particular factors that seem to stand out and also that we're seeing um, that as the pandemic uh, has gotten more intense, uh, these, these scores have started to spike. Uh, next slide, please. Just to give you a sense of what's going on uh, in your neighborhood, uh, here are the most recent, this is the most recent time period uh, that we have and, and really uh, who seems to be struggling uh, the most. Uh, I, I can tell you looking at the really light blue um, uh, states, uh, you know, we have a couple of locations uh, in, in Illinois and if I told them they seem to be doing well comparatively, uh, they would not. Uh, they would not believe me. I know there's a lot of struggling going on, uh, even in this, even in the light states. Uh, but uh, when you look at this, uh, I think you can pretty much overlay. Uh, this is where uh, at least some of these places, certainly on the West Coast, there was a lot of COVID activity going on, a lot of worsening of of of, of COVID. Uh, and um, I can imagine there is some overlap uh, between the symptoms of anxiety disorder and depressive disorder and the numbers that you're hearing uh, every day on the news uh, and, and the deaths and the cases, uh, et cetera. Uh, next slide, please. Specifically, we're here to talk about anxiety. So I wanted to get into anxiety 
Uh, and uh, you know, I've already oriented you to the slide uh, to, to this chart. Um, the differentiation between what we saw before and what we saw now. The other one was anxiety and depression. And this is specifically anxiety uh, that we're looking at. Uh, and the numbers uh, are pretty similar uh, to, than what we, uh, to what we saw before. Uh, 18 to 29, almost half of our young adults uh, are uh, having uh, significant symptoms of anxiety disorder, uh, female uh, more than male, uh, and again, uh, Hispanic uh, or Latino and non-Hispanic black single race uh, over, uh, over um, non-Hispanic white single race. So what you're seeing uh, here is very similar uh, to what we, what we saw before uh, as far uh, as the, as the uh, overlay. Uh, next slide, uh, please, Dr. Bailey. And I also wanted to, again, uh, show this picture. I think this is uh, pretty similar pictures, the states, uh, the state ranking. Uh, might be uh, a little bit different. And this is not a state ranking that you wanna be uh, at the top of, uh, but these are uh, where again, anxiety uh, is particularly challenging. And again, I think uh, you could overlay in a lot of these cases, uh, the case counts uh, and, and the type of, uh, of intensity <coughs> uh, that people uh, are hearing about uh, in their community. Uh, please, uh, next slide. So as I told you, my goal uh, is to talk about uh, what is going on with people uh, or what they're bringing with them to the office. Uh, and, and I think what we've talked about to this point is they're bringing a higher likelihood of, of symptoms of anxiety, higher likelihood of symptoms of depression, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, but but we're, also, uh, we're also talking about what's going on in your home. So uh, there is a significant impact on children uh, that we've had uh, with, with COVID. According to the CDC, again, from April to October, uh, U.S. hospitals saw a 24% increase in the proportion of mental health emergency visits for children aged 5 to 11, and a 31% increase for children aged 12 to 17. So this is even a more significant sign of of stress uh, in, in the system. This is not just having symptoms, this is having symptoms that are severe enough where the family is bringing uh, this child uh, to the emergency room. So it's, uh, it's, it's, very, it's, a, it's a very large uh, increase. And according to, to CMS, uh, Centers for Medicare and Medi uh, Medicare and Medicare uh, Services, uh, from March to May 2020, children on Medicaid received 44% fewer outpatient mental health services than the previous year. So I want you to think about that a little bit. So I'm just telling you that there is more severity. People are having more symptoms. Um, younger adults are having more symptoms. I didn't, we didn't really talk about the significant, uh, we didn't, I didn't really find anything to talk about the uh, symptoms in kids as I didn't think that that was necessarily the, the, the exact point here but you're having more people go to emergency rooms. So, you know, what you, the, the concern obviously is, is if people aren't bringing their children to their outpatient visits, because there are less outpatient visits, uh, then they might be using the emergency room uh, in more times of, of, of stress uh, rather than and having their primary, their primary visits. And, and clearly you're, you might be seeing that uh, if you're doing less visits or let's say telemedicine isn't working so well in your child and adolescent practice, uh, the psychiatric disorder, as we've talked about, isn't going away, it's getting worse. And unfortunately, uh, uh, folks can land up in the ER, uh, kids can land in the ER. And, and obviously, you have, you have families that are kind of dealing with this increased uh, burden uh, with less help. Uh, Dr. Bailey, please. So again, overall, the second pandemic has affected the health, safety, and well-being of individuals uh, and our communities. You know, from an individual perspective, uh, there's insecurity in, in, in all kinds of ways. Uh, we'll talk about a little bit confusion about what to do next. I, it would be nice to say we're a year into it and things seem to be more clear. Things are not a whole lot more clear. They're maybe more hopeful. Uh, but also people have lost a lot of family members between now uh, and, and last year. Emotional and physical isolation, obviously the, what we're asking people to do uh, is, and, and I think Dr. Bailey is gonna get into this a little bit, is completely the opposite of what we would generally uh, tell people to do in order to feel better. Uh, we are telling them that they have to be uh, apart uh, and uh, you know, do not leave your home unit. Um, 
other than work or other type of type of urgent, uh, you know, getting food or, or whatever. And, you know, when we have patients with depression, and anxiety, we have historically told them to engage, you know, take walks, go to the park, go do things with people, um, contact family that you haven't been uh, into. And, and those types of uh, pieces are not only uh, not happening, we're telling people not to do that in order to stay safe. Uh, and then, then obviously there's, there continues to be the, the uh, stigma. Uh, that we're that we're working with, and communities. Obviously, there are economic losses in the communities. Work and school closures, um, inadequate resources for uh, medical response. You know, right now, every time you turn on the TV, you're hearing about how everybody wants vaccines, and there isn't enough vaccines, and where are the vaccines coming coming from? And again, there's there's been a deficient distribution of necessities, which gets into the health equity issues that that began or that that were uh, existing a long time before COVID, but COVID has has just underlined them. Uh, next slide, please. For as far as psychiatric treatment access, uh, what has happened uh, in COVID uh, in, in our area, I think is pretty similar to other areas. Uh, some psychiatric treatment actually closed uh, some places, um, particularly multi-specialty uh, types of hospitals, uh, did attempt to uh, maybe use uh, what they ended up doing was uh, capping or, or closing some of their psychiatric uh, treatments. Some psychiatric, uh, and in some patients, uh, refused to attend treatment uh, because of the types of concerns that we've, we've talked about before. Uh, some patients put off this needed care due to fear of you know, being uh, in small groups with people, you know, a lot of our psychiatric facilities, uh, some of them are, are singles, a lot of them are semi-privates, as we like uh, to call them, uh, and, and that caused a lot of, lot of concern, and, and people oftentimes did not want to get uh, that, that treatment. Um, telemedicine uh, has been uh, really help, helpful for, for many people. Um, you know, being able to uh, utilize telemedicine, being able to be at home uh, and, and uh, call in to, to treaters uh, for, uh, you know, it wasn't really possible before uh, and to get paid uh, for by insurance, uh, but that has uh, opened up access for some people, but there continue to be people that do not want to use telemedicine, that feel that telemedicine does not work well for my particular case or my particular disorder. And we'll talk about there are also some, uh, some uh, difficulties with, uh, uh, with diagnosis and, and that type of thing that we'll get into uh, a little bit. And you know, not every patient very clearly has access to good uh, internet or, or good, uh, good uh, computers or, or iPads or, or laptops. And you know that's something that we uh, have been very fortunate to be uh, associated uh, to have a foundation, and the foundation has been able to provide some of those things. But not again, not everybody has has that ability to do that. Uh, also, as far as treatment access, you know, one of the things that that I do a lot is prescribe psychiatric medicines, and we'll get into that a little bit. But pharmacies, uh, people have been afraid to go to their pharmacies, and I think pharmacies have done a, a reasonably good job uh, with with mail order. You know, getting to um, pivot to mail order pretty quickly. Uh, but clearly one of the big worries about access is people uh, even prior to, to COVID and certainly at the beginning of COVID lost jobs, uh, lost insurance, lost access to care that way. And, and I remember, you know, I'm old enough to remember where there was a lot of concern uh, that the ACA uh, might be overturned. And there was a lot of, lot of anxiety and angst uh, about that, but certainly many people lost jobs. And uh, we uh, have uh, our employment as a primary uh, way to uh, be able to access uh, treatment uh, or insurance uh, and, and treatment uh, through that insurance. So that has been a, a big concern uh, of, of people uh, and uh, our, you know, our, our state and local governments are our state and local governments are working uh, right now, um, you, you know, have been working uh, with this pandemic uh, and uh, trying to figure out how to make sure that Medicaid and is is expanded and, and, and covered and is covering people uh, in the safety net has been a challenge. I know some states are doing that a, a lot better than, than others. And again, um, there are some things uh, that 
uh, specific treatments and modalities uh, that uh, that access uh, has 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 worsened because again, telemedicine uh, isn't the best for everything. We have certainly found that in some of our addiction treatment, um, having people uh, you know, have it ha is that we talked about relapses, but you know we had people uh, video uh, on video drinking. Uh, on video sleeping, on video doing all sorts of things, uh, and it's been a little bit more of a challenge to have them get your drug screens um, and, and that type of thing. It's been, it's been a challenge. Uh, next slide, please. So obviously what changed at the workplace? Uh, for a while, all, you know, many workplaces were just shut down, um, uh, particularly if, if people weren't considered to, to have an, an essential, uh, essential care or an essential job, uh, and that uh, did prevent people from, uh, many people from, from making a living. Uh, I know that we continue to struggle with uh, restaurants and, and uh, bars and those types of facilities uh, that provide a lot of uh, not only recreational uh, space uh, for us, but, but certainly jobs. Um, and uh, you know, at the beginning, uh, there was a lot of concern uh, with that and that, that, certain, that concern continues. Uh, some employers uh, were able to pivot uh, easily uh, to virtual treatment or virtual um, work. Uh, many were not. Uh, so that was uh, certainly a change. Um, decreased demands, again, led other people to have layoffs, uh, increased workload uh, with peer illnesses as, the, as COVID spiked. Uh, what would happen is you'd have less people that would be coming to work. Uh, uh, particularly if you're or, or being able to work, uh, which would increase the workload. Uh, social distance, even, even when you're physically at work, you know, we really were challenged uh, making sure that the social distancing and the mat and the masking and the hand washing uh, was happening and, and having to build that into the workspace uh, led to, you know, at the, at the lowest level awkwardness, uh, but, but certainly uh, led to led to struggles. And then conflict over COVID. Um, there are many workplaces uh, where you have some people that uh, are triple masked and washing their hands every five minutes, and you have other people that are, you know, not believing that COVID's a real thing and that uh, that everybody, uh, you know, that everybody's making too big of a deal out of it. And that certainly has led to a lot of a lot of stress and increased conflict in the workplace. Next slide, please. So yeah, obviously, what can what of this causes anxiety to possibly be worse? I mean, all of it does. Uh, you know, we're I, I've, I've mentioned that I won't go through all of this, but obviously, if if people are uh, if schools are are virtual, uh, what are childcare issues uh, have been a significant concern. I, I know for families, and obviously, if you're going into work, you know, am I going to get sick working? Is my family member who's who's going to work going to get sick and bring it back to me? There's obviously all of those concerns. Um, again, are, is that is my uh, when have I ever cared about my office's air handling system? I mean, that is that is not something that was a thing. That's like a 2020 thing. You know, do we have the right air handler um, to, uh, to to keep us safe? Um, you know, is it a good idea for me to be in a in a in a cubicle? You know, all, all of these things uh, certainly can can cause can cause anxiety. Next slide, please. So, what's going on in the workplace? There's a substantial um, number of of people report increased depression and anxiety in the workplace, and in a lot of this, uh, you can look at it whether they're essential quote unquote essential workers or not. And the essential workers, uh, clearly, the people that are having to go in because they have to go in, uh, there is a there is a spike. Uh, in, in anxiety, uh, for sure. So according to the Family Foundation Health Tracking Poll, uh, pretty recent numbers, uh, essential workers uh, compared to quote unquote non-essential workers report increased anxiety and depression much more frequently, almost 50% of the time versus 30% of the time, higher percentages of substance use almost triple <coughs> and higher rates of suicidal thoughts. So again, these, these essential workers in particular are ones that seem uh, to be struggling uh, even more. Uh, next slide, uh, Dr. Bailey. I think you have a, a menu up there, please. Or is that me? Nope, that's me. Ooh, good. All right, uh, and then I just have some, some more uh, data to show you. Again, changing from 2019 to 2020, uh, reported symptoms 
in the workplace have tripled from 8.1% to 25.5%. This is the National Institute for Healthcare Management Foundation. Uh, depression symptoms have also quadrupled in late June 2020, again, 75%. And we saw this on the Pulse survey. 75% uh, of young adults uh, were uh, reporting at least one adverse mental or behavioral health symptom. Uh, and 31% uh, of uh, people, or 51% of uh, people reported worse mental health at work since COVID-19 started, which again is not surprising. Next slide, please. I have another one of these. Lots of, lots of graphs and slides. So when the employees are reporting that these uh, mental health factors uh, that have uh, worsened with the pandemic, uh, a great number, whether you're at home uh, or on site, uh, are reporting these, uh, and they are affecting motivation to work, team morale, productivity, stress at work, work-life balance, um, et cetera. I mean, you can you can look at the at the on-site people, uh, particularly the stress at work, and and how significant uh, that number uh, is is comparatively. And again, you can also look. This is another uh, look at another set of data: uh, whites versus blacks versus Latinos. Uh, there is definitely differentiation. Uh, between uh, whites and uh, and non-whites, and uh, again, they feel in general like there's nobody to turn to at work. And part of that is if you if you look at the pie pie graphs, there um, they don't feel necessarily comfortable uh, talking to their supervisors uh, or their coworkers um, uh, to this. Uh, so it's all it's all very uh, much uh, happening at work. It's very much a real deal. And as we talked about all of these issues uh, here in this uh, little almost looks like a cor uh, <laughs> coronavirus uh, picture there, uh, you know, leading to all of these, all, all of these uh, stressful situations. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, as we're going to talk about uh, a little bit more, uh, once I'm going to be handing it over to Dr. Bailey in just a couple of minutes, uh, you know, the anxiety uh, issues in the workplace, anxiety disorders, uh, generalized anxiety, social anxiety, panic disorder with agoraphobia, OCD, symptoms of PTSD, social anxiety, those are all things that Dr. Uh, Dr. Bailey is going to, uh, going to cover. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, diagnostic strategies, again, uh, access uh, challenges, we talked about that. Uh, you know, one of the things that has been nice about, um, about telemedicine, uh, certainly I, I have noticed in my own practice, uh, being with somebody in a room with the mask and the shield, uh, you know, if you're able to do telemedicine, your mental status exam is, is, is a lot easier. Honestly, uh, and that has been, um, you know, that's been a benefit uh, to telemedicine. But a lot of our most acute care, uh, when you're face to face with people, you are wearing masks, and and you know, we do lose data uh, as mental health professionals uh, when you're masked and you're and you're six feet away. Um, I think one of the other big uh, pieces that we've had to struggle is, you know, where does reasonable stop? You know, we talked about uh, this is obviously a very stressful situation. It's unprecedented. Um, and, uh, you know, in the past, uh, if it's a reasonable anxiety, you know, when you treat it, obviously you treat it when it starts to affect somebody's life, uh, when they're not able to function uh, as well. And you have people right now that are functioning because they have to, they're mandatory going to work. Uh, and how can you, you know, how, how, how can you support them? And, and we're going to continue to talk about that. Next slide, please. So from a medication perspective, from a physician perspective, you know, if this is the, the um, uh, coronavirus, uh, I am, I do prescribe for longer periods of time um, than I would otherwise, uh, just because of difficulty, oftentimes getting to uh, pharmacies or getting medication refills. You know, we've worked a, more with insurance companies to give 90 day supplies versus 30 day supplies or even 60 day supplies, uh, just because, uh, you know, we don't necessarily, if we don't have to uh, want to send people out. As I said, there's been some struggle getting medications uh, to the patients, uh, but in general, uh, I, I think what we have seen uh, has been more effective is to be more aggressive than less aggressive because you're going to find, uh, we're finding, 
uh, that uh, the severity uh, of illness out there, whether people are, are saying it directly to you uh, or not, is the severity is very high. And if we're not treating uh, everything and asking questions uh, and, and being uh, very dogged with trying to get answers to those questions, we're going to miss something. Uh, and, and, people, and people die when we miss something, as, as you know. Next slide, please. So that is, that is my presentation. So I will hand it over to Dr. Bailey. Thank you, Dr. Bailey. Thank you, Dr. Halverson. Um, and for setting that up for all of the stresses that we are experiencing right now, um, it's, it really kind of sets the stage for what we need to do for interventions. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about that. Um, just to level set with everybody. Ooh, a second. My slide's not advancing. There we go. Hopefully you can all see that. Um, we offer at Rogers um, empirically supported treatments. That just means everything that we're offering for treatment has been validated in the research. So this just gives an overview of some of the treatments that we would offer. Um, we do a lot of exposure-based interventions for anxiety disorders. There's some listed here specifically um, for a more kind of comprehensive look at anxiety disorders, the um, exposure therapy for anxiety disorders by Abramowitz et al. is something I would recommend. And then we also use behavioral activation, which is also, also an empirically supported treatment for depression. Um, and I'm gonna go into a little bit more of what this looks like, but essentially with for depression, we are emphasizing um, activity scheduling and gradually reincorporating routine valued and enjoyable activities. So for anxiety disorders, a broad overview, and this is looking at OCD in particular, um, we have this catastrophic belief such as if I um, am exposed to germs, I will get an illness. Some people are afraid of dying from that illness. It can look different for every person. Then I have this increased attention towards um, potential threats and I see danger in things that others don't. And I also might have a lower threshold for danger signals related to germs. Um, so something typical like a table looks more dangerous to me because I have these beliefs about germs. And then I will have some sort of threat forecast in that moment with that specific situation of seeing that table. I might think if I touch this object, it'll get me sick. If I get sick, I will die. Um, and because that's my interpretation of that stimuli, I'm gonna feel a lot of anxiety. And I find it helpful with patients to go through specifically what that anxiety feels like to them. So they have kind of a cue of when they're in a situation that's um, potentially great for exposures and when they might have increased urges to ritualize. And then um, in that situation where I'm interpreting this thing as dangerous for a specific reason, I would engage in a lot of safety behaviors. So I might just avoid completely not touch it. I might escape. Um, somehow leave the room. I, if I do have to interact with that stimulus, I might um, excessively wash my hands or I might use barriers in order to touch it. And the problem with those behaviors is that they continue to reinforce that belief that these things are dangerous and if they get an illness, they will die. Um, and so for exposure and response prevention or you know, exposure and ritual prevention, we want to expose the person to these items that they have this threat forecast for, um, where they pay particular attention to these things, see them as more dangerous than other people would. And then we facilitate um, response prevention or ritual prevention so that they don't continue to reinforce that belief um, in that inaccurate threat forecast in that situation. If we apply it to another anxiety disorder like social anxiety disorder, might have the belief if I draw attention to myself, I'll be ridiculed. Then in situations, I'm more sensitive to the potential for being ridiculed. So in a, around my coworkers, that could be a really threatening situation because all of them may judge me, they may ridicule me. I might draw too much attention to myself. These people are going to judge me as the prediction. I feel anxious in that situation. And then I use safety behaviors to uh, reduce my anxiety. So I might completely avoid the situation or while in the situation, I might avoid contact. Uh, eye contact, pretend to be busy. I've had patients who would, um, you know, wear headphones, even though there was nothing playing in the headphones, just so that people wouldn't approach them um, or pretend to sleep in situations and, or find an excuse to leave that situation when the anxiety becomes too high. And that continues to reinforce this idea that if I do draw attention to myself, I will be ridiculed. So we would expose them to situations um, that cause that anxiety where they have that fear elicited and then we'd ask them to not engage in those behaviors and slowly over time uh, chip away at that belief. For depression, uh, with the behavioral activation, 
approach, this is the general kind of model for that. So it's the trap cycle. So we acknowledge that there are life events that are stressful and it makes a lot of sense why someone would have an unpleasant emotional reaction to some of these things. So having um, lost a relationship, lost a loved one, divorce, lack of friends, um, lack of social support, those are obviously going to lead to um, unpleasant emotions. And what we are trying to do, um, and typically those unpleasant emotions are gonna lead someone to wanna to avoid and alleviate those emotions in the moment and to escape those emotion. What we find is that when someone engages in those avoidant patterns, it either makes the initial trigger worse or it creates new triggers for unpleasant emotions. So if someone's having um, a lot of conflict at work, they feel upset and stressed um, and you know, kind of like hopeless about that situation, they may avoid work and that actually may cause that conflict at work to get worse um, or they may lose their job and that altogether is a, another stressful life event that's gonna cause more unpleasant emotions. So this is helpful in reviewing the patients because it just highlights that their depression does make sense. Of course, when you're feeling that way, which most people would in response to those triggers, it makes sense that you wanna engage in those behaviors. For treatment, what we're working on is while you will have those urges, we want to try to um, in reintegrate um, stable and diverse sources of positive reinforcement, meaning like things that would either address the trigger directly or at least bring some more pleasure back into someone's life. And we want diverse resources because um, if someone's really putting all of their eggs in one basket, that basket could break and then there's really not anything to help them. Uh, otherwise. So our goal is to introduce that active coping and that stops that cycle of creating new or worsening the existing triggers. And so we'll say we want to get out of the trap and back on track. And then also looking at COVID-19's effect on mental health, uh, Dr. Halverson has already set this up, but just kind of reinforcing that there's, there's a lot of impact um, for people who are, um, you know, one study, and this research is ongoing. I mean, it's been less than a year since this is really picked up. So um, what we're finding in the research is that women and young people, the socially disadvantaged, and those with pre-existing mental health conditions have the most uh, significant mental health outcomes during the pandemic. So it kind of already worsens the, for those who have mental health concerns. Um, and then we're also seeing uh, certain segments of the population be more at risk. Um, so we also are looking at, um, the BIPOC community and seeing that some, um, communities are more heavily impacted by COVID-19. So Black Americans are accounting for a disproportionately high number of positive COVID cases. And we're also finding, um, uh, increased death among that population as well from COVID-19. And then uh, communities who already were struggling with accessing resources are further disenfranchised by COVID-19 um, and experiencing more stressors. For uh, COVID-19's effect on mental health, um, the effects are many. So this is just a, a few of those that you know, we're thinking of and seeing, um, but just grief in general. So there's grief from the impact of COVID and death uh, for loved ones. But also if you are experiencing loss anyways, there's been a significant strain on the celebration of life for people who have passed away. And that can be really stressful. Um, you know, you've, you've, someone had this beautiful life and it was taken away and it was taken away during a time where we actually can't gather and celebrate this person's life. We can't travel to go to services, um, to be with our loved ones when in such a, a hard time, that's a hard time anyways for a lot of people. Um, we're also seeing, you know, one of our basic human needs is social contact, and we are the likely the most isolated we've ever been in our history um, because we are being instructed not to interact and physically distance and um, can't access a social events that we would normally go to for that connection. Even um, we can't regularly interact with coworkers and you may or may not like your coworkers, but at least you have some form of interaction. And if you're working from home, you probably have much less. Um, we aren't leaving our homes. We're not able to visit those who are sick um, because they could, you know, we could 
put them at risk. Um, and this is a time where you'd want to go visit your loved ones and be there to help them. And if you are a person who is at risk um, and has co-occurring conditions that could um, lead to more adverse outcomes because of COVID-19, you can't have people come over to help or provide some assistance in your life. So that's really challenging for those families. And then there's limited traveling from a you know, leisure and vacation standpoint, people haven't been able to engage in the typical travel that they would throughout the year. And from just a, you want to go see your loved ones who live far away, you're not able to travel to go see them. So um, some of us have been you know, a year without seeing our close loved ones. Um, and then just uh, changes in general are hard for people, even if they're happy changes. So like the birth of a child or getting married or a promotion at work, like those, even though they're exciting and happy, they can be really hard for people. And these aren't those happy changes. These are really difficult changes for people to be going through. Um, the structure completely is different for working um, for a lot of people, um, even if we're you know, if you're still in your workplace and still presenting to work, um, the changes in the workspace have been rapid. And so anecdotally, when this all started, you know, we all had to like really quickly pivot and figure out how we're going to continue to serve the community. And while at the time it was kind of exciting, like, look what we're doing, look at all that we've achieved to continue to help people. Um, there came a point where it's just like, you want one predictable day or one predictable week and, you know, we'd send joke emails like, okay, it's, you know, 9 a.m. on Tuesday, here's update 59 of the day, you know, like just it, things were just changing so rapidly. And while it can be exciting and, you know, build your confidence, there comes a time where you just want that predictability back. Um, looking at how just in general, workplace anxiety can manifest for different conditions. And this isn't a you know, completely comprehensive list, but things that we've seen in our clinics. Um, for social anxiety, we have just a general avoidance of work events. So someone who's not you know, going out after work or eating lunch with everybody or you know, doing like a lunch and learn with other people, um, they are um, avoidant of any situations where they might be scrutinized. And that can imp impact just their job trajectory if they're not uh, kind of putting their, themselves out there. Um, safety behaviors related to performance. So we might see someone who has to go to work because they're, you know, very afraid of sweating. They have to wear many layers, even if their office is blistering, um, which actually makes it more likely that they're going to sweat. But um, avoiding eye contact with coworkers, you know, looking for a secluded space to work, um, opting for not sharing an office. Um, and then uh, turning down promotions because of the potential to have to engage more socially or have to perform in front of others. Uh, missing work. So if, the, if there is a time where they may have to perform as a requirement of their job, they may you know, find a reason to call in sick that day or not attend that day or essentially um, put the, the task off for a very long time. Folks who experience social anxiety um, can kind of present two different ways generally. Um, one is a very quiet presentation, someone who doesn't speak up, someone who doesn't really engage with others. Uh, and then there's more of an aloof presentation where someone may engage, but they seem standoffish or, um, you know, they don't put themselves out there, even though they're, they're engaged, they kind of like, you are always at a distance and you can't really predict them. And then um, there's a lot of potential reassurance seeking, uh, worked with people who are really afraid of um, offending other people and socially anxious about that. So if they say anything, they kind of mentally rehearse the conversations they've had throughout the day. And at the end of the day, they send emails saying like, I'm really sorry I did this. I hope that didn't offend you. And the response is usually like, I, I don't even remember that happening or I didn't interpret it that way. So just making sure that they're not hurting other people's feelings, which can, you know, if that, that happens frequently can be hard on coworkers and they may distance themselves from that person. Uh, for OCD, we have, um, and this can be kind of across anxiety disorders, but perfectionism that comes up where people turn in assignments late because they're stuck wanting to send the most finished, most detailed product. Um, they may work excessive hours because they're trying to, again, attain, obtain some sort of uh, perfect standard that's uh, really difficult to obtain um, and kind of sunk costs at some point, like did that extra six hours really result in that much change to that product that, you know, was noticeable? Likely not. 
avoidance of large gatherings. This can be, um, you know, fear that they might uh, say something inappropriate, fear of germs, fear that there might be children at that event, that they're afraid that they might be a pedophile and interacting with children can be really difficult. Um, missing work altogether and calling in sick. Uh, also kind of be, being MIA at work and that can be because they're stuck ritualizing other places. Um, so we've had people come into treatment where it was noted frequently that they weren't at work even though they were seen at work and during the day, like when people are trying to go to their office or find them, they couldn't find them a lot of times or they always seem to be on break. And a lot of times they were stuck ritualizing in some way. Um, there can be just bizarre behavior. I mean, we, I work in residential, so we tend to see the more severe complex cases, but I've had people who cover their keyboards in um, plastic wrap to try to protect it from germs, wear gloves to work, um, seem preoccupied. Um, because they're kind of, you know, saying, doing rituals in their head, um, or may like make noises or, you know, something that just seems odd to other people. And it's to, a ritual to reduce their anxiety. And then reassurance seeking similar to other disorder, anxiety disorders, um, making sure that they're completing something the exact right way, or making sure that they didn't say something inappropriate to other people. Over explaining can be a big one that can um, grind on your coworkers and supervisors. Um, it's like you can't ask a question and get a very simple answer. And so people may stop coming to them to ask questions because they know like, I just need a 10 second response and it's gonna be five minutes. So I'd rather just not ask that person. For generalized anxiety disorders, um, there we tend to see people who are either arriving excessively early to work because they're afraid that something bad will happen on the way there that will interrupt their um, progression to work or they are leaving very late because they're worried they didn't get things done throughout the day that they needed to. Um, asking frequent clarifying questions. Uh, it's a form of reassurance seeking, but just wanting to be sure they understand 100%. There's that intolerance of uncertainty. So if any little doubt comes up about that what they're being asked to do, they frequently go back and ask questions. So worked with someone who um, just worked in a department store in the idea of putting the window display in was completely terrifying because that person wanted to ask a hundred, a thousand questions about how exactly to do that task. And we were trying to get them to do that without asking as many questions. So kind of putting a limit on the number of questions they could ask. Uh, missing work just because they're you know fearful that maybe something else might happen in their life, but then that kind of plays into the fears because if you're missing work, then they're also worried about the financial strain of potentially losing their job. Difficulty concentrating because they're preoccupied with their worries um, and overly focused on minor details kind of go back goes back to the clarifying questions. Like you can't just give an instruction, a broad instruction. You have to narrow and funnel it down to the finest detail for a person who experienced generalizing anxiety disorder. Um, so that can be really difficult for their colleagues. And then panic disorder, what we often see is just missing work entirely or leaving early because um, the feared physical sensations manifest either before or after work. And there's such fear associated with that symptom that something terrible is going to happen. They're going to lose control, um, you know, some sort of medical catastrophe that they, they get and it you know, reinforces that cycle. And then they become more anxious and more anxious and more anxious. And finally, they just escape. Um, and then also appearing preoccupied because they are so attuned to their physical sensations that their mind is constantly monitoring their bodily functions to see, um, you know, am I on the verge of experiencing panic, which is very scary. And then for uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, we see similarly difficulty concentrating and exhaustion, and that can be for many reasons. Um, there's disrupted sleep that's part of the uh, symptoms of the disorder, and then also hypervigilance, which is can just um, great on your nervous system and make people very exhausted. Um, working long hours, typically as an avoidance or a distraction, if the trauma happened at home, um, they don't, or, you know, in their car or something like that, they're trying to avoid that situation so much that they might just stay at work as a distraction. Easily startled with that hypervigilance kind of on edge. And then um, may sometimes be on autopilot due to dissociating. So they just kind of like go throughout the day and um, are detached and not really seeming like they're completely uh, together or seeming distracted. 
So I know that this talk was about um, anxiety. I find it very hard to talk about anxiety without talking about depression because the two are so often comorbid. Um, you're likely not going to have an anxiety disorder without depression or vice versa. And so some of the you know, workplace symptoms that you can see for depression is missing work or tardiness um, just due to, you know, feeling lethargic and feeling down and hopeless. Um, disrupted ADLs, so not showering or attending to hygiene, uh, not for uh, men or those with facial hair, not clean shaven, um, not seeming like they're, you know, putting on deodorant and doing daily tasks. They may, their workplace may be um, more disorganized than normal because they're not able to keep up on that, those things. More isolated than normal and withdrawn. So, you know, you might have someone who's withdrawn due to social anxiety, but isolation also plays a role in depression. So the more isolated someone becomes, the more depressed they're likely to feel. Um, so this, for someone with new onset depression, this would, they would seem more isolated and withdrawn than normal. And then just generally feeling hopeless and helpless and this pessimism about things not getting better. So it's hard to talk about anxiety without talking about depression. And then what I was finding is talking about anxiety and depression in the work for, workplace, it's really hard not to mention burnout. And so with the rapid changes we've had that have occurred, um, it's really all of these added stressors that we're all facing, it's hard not to talk about burnout in the workplace. So this term was coined in 1974 and it was officially recognized by the World Health Organization in 2019. So it's an occupational phenomenon that's um, not classified as a medical condition, but a syndrome. So um, it's the result of chronic workplace stress that has not been successfully managed. And it's characterized by these three dimensions. So fatigue, these sleep disturbances, appetite changes, and lowered immunity to illness. And so sleep and appetite changes obviously are related to depression as well. Um, pessimism, cynicism, it's also called uh, depersonalization in their job. So feeling kind of hopeless and helpless, feeling very pessimistic about their job and their job prospects and outlook. Um, and this can lead to them sometimes missing work because who cares, it doesn't matter. Um, no one cares about me in my workplace anyway, so why go, why put in the effort? Um, and it's, it creates this kind of mental distance from work so that they're trying to like stave off that stress by distancing themselves, but it also leads to more stress because then they're not feeling fulfilled in their job. And then reduced professional efficacy. So feeling like they're working, but really not accomplishing anything. And this a long time ago was brought up as a um, kind of key to burnout or recognizing burnout among your supervisees is they seem like they're working. They seem like they're here and getting stuff done, but I'm not really seeing a lot of product from them. And so they might be showing up to work, but they don't have a ton of motivation and they're not able to engage in the task or they don't find the task meaningful anymore, part of that cynicism. And then they're not really as engaged as they used to be and um, able to be um, proficient in their job. Um, the theme of exhaustion seems to be one facet of burnout that is related to a lot of different models of burnout that are out there. So it keeps coming up as like one of these more predictive facets. And then looking out at burnout versus engagement. Engagement is what we want. We want this energy and this resilience in your work environment and productivity. Um, burnout's the opposite of that. It's the loss of energy, feeling completely exhausted, feeling very pessimistic and cynical about one's job and not being able to produce a lot. And there's some um, kind of dimensions that have been found to relate to, you know, if we are high on this dimension, we might be more engaged. So control is that uh, this theme that consistently emerges in the literature of looking at someone's perceived personal control in their workplace in this kind of um, latitude they have in decision-making or feeling like they are part of decision-making within the organization can um, lead to increased engagement. Uh, community, so the quality of the social interactions at work. So that is, and again, this is specific to work, but having, feeling like you work among confident, competent, helpful teammates versus like feeling like you're the only one trying and the people around you aren't helpful or really aren't working as hard. Um, this can also have uh, an impact from your supervisor too, feeling like you are supported by your manager or your supervisor and that that person is there to help and is also competent in what they do. And they also determine a lot of your workload. So understanding that they are looking out for you and wanting to help you. 
um, fairness and that uh, the work that I'm putting in is being appropriately rewarded and it's not always monetary. A lot of times that's what we're looking for, right? We don't do jobs for free typically. So um, we're looking for that, you know, um, package and reward, financial reward, but we're also just looking for recognition and reward. There are people recognizing that what I do matters and that um, they are uh, appreciative of my output and understanding how hard I'm working. Um, reward kind of goes to the, the fairness piece too. Um, is there a congruence between your reward and the effort that you put in? Workload tends to be the one that impacts exhaustion, which is one of the facets that's more strongly related to burnout. Um, and this can be qualitative workload are the things that I'm doing um, qualitatively helpful or I'm able to um, accomplish them and quantitative, like the amount of things that I'm doing. So you could be doing a lot of little unnecessary things and wanting to do the bigger things um, or having a lot of big things that you need to do that all require a lot of your attention. And these demands can really deplete your ability to meet those job demands, feeling like you're not being effective and then kind of starting that cycle of cynicism as well. And is my work that I'm doing within this organization consistent with my values? And sometimes people will have a discrepancy between their values and the work and shift and become uh, to value more of the work that they're doing for the organization. Or a lot of times if they find that conflict, that role conflict between the two, they're probably gonna look for other employment um, because doing meaningful work is really what's important to people at the end of the day. And if they're feeling like the work they're doing isn't meaningful or it's kind of even going against their values, they may not wanna work for that organization. So the relationship between burnout, they, they are highly related, but are distinct. Um, and so some of the ways that they overlap are some of these physical symptoms, that pessimism or that helplessness, hopelessness feeling, um, this loss of sense of mastery or self-efficacy, which we do see as an important part of behavioral activation too, feeling like not only is this work pleasurable, because sometimes it's not, values aren't always pleasurable activities, but is that work meaningful to me? Do I feel like I'm an effective person when I do it? Uh, sorry, there's a snowblower going by. I didn't anticipate that. Um, and, but while they are overlapping in some of these areas, depression is a more robust feature that's, you know, kind of pan situational. It's not just related to work where burnout is a specific work facet. Um, and then we do, they do find in the literature that one can onset the other, and then it creates this downward spiral that worsens both. So if you have burnout at time one and it increases over to time two, you're more likely to have depression symptoms at time three and an increase in depression symptoms and vice versa. And then we also find that burnout mediates the relationship between that job strain and depression. So to know whether you're burnout, you might feel it and understand it, but there's also um, surveys out there that can be helpful. So one that we use is the professional quality of life. I use it with the super, my supervisees and you go out through, you score, there's a you know scoring method for it and everything. And it gives you these um, two areas, actually three. So compassion, satisfaction, um, the pleasure you're deriving from the work that you do and the work that you do well. And then compassion fatigue, which has two dimensions of just burnout, just feeling exhausted and um, overworked essentially. And then compa compassion fatigue, which is uh, feelings of hopelessness in uh, difficulties dealing with work or doing your job effectively. So that professional efficacy piece. A very common measure is the, I'm going to say the name wrong, Moslock burnout inventory, the MBI, but that's proprietary and it has licensing fees. So um, while it's a very well-known measure, it's not always accessible to everybody. And what they have found is there is a single assessment item out there that um, is pretty robust and relates to the overall score, especially exhaustion, the facet of exhaustion on the MBI. Um, so I've provided it here. Um, you know, one one question surveys are what they are. They can be helpful. It's hard. I think it's a little hard to answer these because they're a little bit uh, double barreled in terms of, you know, I feel this and this. And I, you know, I might say like, I feel this, but I don't feel this piece of it. So it can be hard to determine, but they do find that scores on this are um, pretty highly related to burnout. We do know that burnout worsens stress levels. So the more burnout you become, the worse your stress levels, uh, or the higher your stress levels become. Um, it predisposes people to chronic health conditions. That's part of the, um, the World Health Organization dimension of exhaustion. Um, and then we also see that mental health care workers in particularly are a stressed and vulnerable group. So it's important for you all to know this and assess this for yourself because you are at risk for burnout. 
Um, and even within that category of mental health care workers, we do find that sexual minorities are at an increased risk of burnout, in particular male sexual minorities. Uh, factors that are negatively associated with burnout. So as burnout increases, these factors go down. Uh, perceived organizational support, which is our own assessment of how valuable we are to an organization and whether, whether that organization cares about us. Um, supervisor support, and it doesn't have to be necessarily like a psychology supervisor, but your manager as well. Um, does your supervisor value your contribution um, and care about your well-being? Are they organized? Are they interested? Are they competent, friendly, helpful? Um, are they kind of a team player? Um, your social support, both within the job and outside of the job, do you have helpful, com competent, interested coworkers, or do you come from a very hostile work environment, which can increase burnout, increase stress levels? And then um, latitude and independence in decision making, that's one that frequently emerges as uh, kind of helping to reduce the effects of burnout is uh, having employees feel like they have some decision making in their day-to-day -day job versus you know, kind of working in a, a factory setting where this is exactly what I do every day and I don't have a choice. And we do, there's plenty of research out there, although mostly it's for um, physicians and nurses, but I think there's, there's research on office workers as well, but there is a pretty big financial cost to companies that um, the more burnout your, your employees are, the more, the sicker they are, the more work that they miss, um, you know, the more um, FMLA they might have to take to address these issues. So it is a significant financial burden as well. So what are some of the work-related modifications that we would make? Um, and this is kind of not just COVID-19, but in general, COVID-19 is um, kind of intertwined in here. So uh, making sure, I always consider, do we need to get an HR representative involved? And that can offer some confidentiality for our patient. Um, in addressing work-related needs and the HR, um, uh, HR, I'm trying, I can't think of the word, but that, that uh, part of the company is usually pretty accommodating and wanting to work with the employee. It's rare that an HR department, that was the word I was looking for, isn't. Um, so getting them involved versus bringing this to their supervisor, you don't really know how the supervisor is going to respond. And a lot of times, you know, the supervisor might say like, this is a really great thing to bring to HR. I can't really make these accommodations and you'd have to talk to them. So involving HR is always very helpful. Um, addressing work routine and especially work routine disruptions due to COVID-19. So are you essentially having a very good boundary between your work and home life, that becomes very difficult when you're working from home. And um, also, if you are, if you want them to be arriving and leaving on time for work, whether they're in person or at home, you might have to be addressing these other routine activities like we would from a behavioral activation standpoint of how's your sleep hygiene? Are you waking up in time to get your ADLs completed? Are you completing your ADLs and feeling ready for work? Um, so in leaving on time, um, that could be just some time management interventions as well, and also um, some assertiveness and talking to their supervisor about some of the demands that they feel they're not able to meet at this time. And if, if there's any compromise or problem solving that can go on between the two. Minimizing working from home distractions. So that can be really difficult um, in that there, there should be a good boundary between work and home. So we've had people in our um, at Rogers that have worked from home before the pandemic. And that I remember talking to someone then they said that I have an office and at, on Friday when I leave, I shut that door and I don't open that door again. It's only my office so that it, I don't see a blinking light on my phone and feel that pull to like, oh, let me check real quick. Um, they just completely separate themselves from that work, which is important. And then or organizing your workload and learning to prioritize and schedule tasks. And this, um, a lot of the activity scheduling that we use in behavioral activation can be helpful in this too, and you can rate and predict, um, and then write your actual predicted pleasure and mastery and difficulty from doing that task. Because a lot of times what we see, and not all the time, but a lot of times you predict that you're not going to feel good. You're not going to feel like you accomplished something. It's going to be way too difficult. And then when you actually do it, that was more so anticipatory ratings and it wasn't as hard. Um, we want to assess avoidance and prioritizing too. And I usually use the phrase eat eat the frog. So um, the idea of like, if every day you had to eat a frog in the morning, would you rat or you had to eat the frog at some point during that day, would you rather just eat it and get it over with and not have to worry about it? Or do you want to save it and save it and save it until midnight when you finally have to eat that frog and you've been thinking about it all day? The whole frog, frog legs can sometimes be delicious. So the entire frog is disgusting and you don't want to eat it. 
So when we're prioritizing tasks, find the one that's gonna be the hardest, the one that's gonna weigh on you and try to eat, eat the frog earlier in the day. And then be gradual if possible. If somebody has really been avoiding a lot of work tasks, you can't just jump all in, probably wanna be more gradual so that they don't feel overwhelmed and wanna quit and avoid. Um, I've talked a little bit about setting up that work from home environment and even like making it enjoyable by redecorating the space and making it someplace you want to be. Um, and then throughout the day, you can make sure that someone is taking breaks, not as an avoidance, but as, you know, just regular self-care breaks throughout the day. And maybe even incorporating BA, BA tasks into that, do something enjoyable or get a routine activity started or done. Uh, and then limiting and just in general for mental health, I think limiting social media is important and there's apps that you can do that can block you at first, but over time you want that person to be independent and being able to make the choices of to go on or not and to stop um, and use the pre-Mac principle if I or the grandma principle, if I do this task for 20 minutes, I get a five minute break. Um, and there's a actually online, it's called My Tomatoes. It's the Pomodoro technique. I think that was initiated by Toyota where you can um, it times it out for you and tells you when your breaks are and you can list what you did and then it starts the timer and that's work time and then it gives you a break after 25 minutes. And at home, removing bookmarks from your web browser can be helpful so it's not as distracting. You have to make a much more conscious effort to go and do those things. We want to be um, gradual and manageable with these tasks. We don't want to, um, at least from our approach at Rogers, we don't, when, the, when we get patients who are very severe and um, have not been engaging in a lot of activities for a very long time. The idea of doing them makes them want to avoid. And so doing it gradually can kind of get their foot in the door and make them feel a sense of mastery and build their um, self-efficacy. And as much as possible, this can be hard, but we try to mirror activities that they might see at work. So uh, we might do job interview questions or we might um, have them write questions out that are really challenging for them to hear and go in and ask them those questions when they're doing work. Um, we want to, um, in when someone's kind of reintegrating back into work a lot, because we do higher levels of care, they're typically on a, um, a leave from work when they're getting treatment, and we can support them in our PHP and IOP reintegrating back into work and using that as situational exposures where they're going to practice uh, ritual prevention. And then they also have the support of the team to kind of go and process through that and talk about the challenges and plans moving forward um, that are consistent with their treatment. And we also, for COVID-19, we really want to understand the company's policy and guidelines uh, for COVID-19. If the company has guidelines that are less than CDC, we are actually going to opt for the patient to engage in CDC guidelines. Um, but is that company really encouraging or discouraging in-person work? Um, does the person have to share an office? And if so, what's the protocol for sharing an office? What does eating look like at work in uh, masking? So we want to stay within those bounds. Um, and not be more excessive than work, but we don't want to be less than CDC guidelines at the same time. Um, these are some slides on how this might look in the workplace. So uh, for OCD, it's really important that we only follow CDC guidelines. Usually the rituals are far more extensive than what CDC is recommending. So they are washing their hands for five to 10 minutes, whereas CDC guidelines are less. Um, we, we had had people who don't want to remove their masks to drink water, so they literally are not drinking water all day long and dehydrated. So we you know that you can appropriately pull down your mask so that you're not touching the front of it. When you're able to maintain distance, take a sip of water, put your mask back on. If you did touch the front of it, you would use hand sanitizer, hand sanitizer but that's kind of the limit. We don't want you having to like um, move into a completely different room if even though you can be six feet apart from someone um, because that's going above those guidelines. And then limiting the cleaning of spaces and objects really it's whatever the guidelines are for that company and then or if someone's been in the room with them. So for um, generalized anxiety disorder we put limits on how many times they're able to ask questions um, and so you know they may it may be too hard to not ask one reassurance question but they only get one um, set limits on asking clarifying questions. You kind of have to proceed with the task as you understand it without asking clarifying questions for at least one hour and see where you're at at that time and see if you can keep going. And then some unsolvable concerns like what if I get COVID-19 and they're catastrophizing that outcome, uh, we might consider doing imaginal exposures for that. We wouldn't actually expose them to COVID-19. For social anxiety, um, being more socially engaged when possible 
uh, in their workplace and then joining, maybe making phone calls or joining virtual clubs and uh, setting some goals for interacting with others, asking, you know, three questions or commenting at least once during a meeting. And for panic disorder, some things to think about with COVID-19 limitations are the interoceptive exposures, such as rapid breathing um, or stepping up and down on stairs that get your physical sensations up and that feeling of anxiety up. We want to make sure that when you're doing that, you're appropriately distanced um, because we are increasing your respiration at that time. And for PTSD, we um, have sometimes in vivo exposures of uh, physical contact, which we should not have um, if the people are not masked. But you know, like sitting close to someone or sitting within one foot of someone, where they might not do that, or they would you know want at least two feet of distance because that feels more comfortable. Um, we would only want to do those things when they're properly masked. And then sometimes difficulty wearing the mask because of past trauma, feeling like it's you know covering their mouth or they can't breathe. Um, we've had to approach this not as often as you would think. We've had it come up you know once or twice where we have we focus all of our energy on being able to wear a mask as exposures and wearing it for a certain amount of time, taking a break and repeating that process over and over again. I wanted to highlight that when we're doing contamination exposures, we are not actually exposing someone to coronavirus. We are in situations where there's um, limited risk and it's a realistic situation such as touching a table. Um, we aren't asking them to go into a testing facility and lick tables in a COVID testing facility that would be um, out disproportionate with risk. And we're still following ritual prevention in these situations. So we're not necessarily exposing them to COVID, but we might be uh, reducing the rituals according to CDC guidelines. And we have, there was an OCD talk done for um, Rogers already from our uh, Dr. Franklin and Dr. Park that's available too for more discussion on that. Um, I know we're coming up close to time, so I'll go through these a little bit quickly. Um, there was a, a study looking at ways to address burnout in, facil in um, business, and there's this traditional approach of kind of like increasing the resources of the person, the individual approach, and then there's a part participatory approach where we not only increase the individual's resources and time management and stress management and things like that, but we also involve the company in negotiating some of the uh, strain that's been happening and they did find that that participatory intervention was more effective than the traditional intervention. So encouraging people to approach their workplace and be assertive um, and use some of those interpersonal effectiveness skills can be really helpful in reducing burnout. Primary interventions for burnout are promoting resilience among your employees. And this could be through supervisor support, regular sleep, encouraging regular sleep, regular eating, um, healthy activities. Physical activity has been seen to reduce both depression and burnout up fairly consistently. So some companies offer on-site yoga, encourage standing and stretching breaks, uh, particularly for a virtual platform. Um, but we do have to be careful about exercise and using exercise equipment during COVID-19. And what's been nice is a lot of um, gyms are now offering virtual classes that you can do at home or do in your office or, you know, do a team's mindfulness uh, minute. So there's uh, more virtual options and could be poten potentially more comprehensive and in including more employees. Secondary interventions are for those who are identified at high risk for burnout and, and increasing their own personal resources to stave off burnout. And then tertiary interventions are for those who have been identified as being high in burnout and needing some interventions. And a lot of times that can look like a behavioral activation approach because the two are so linked. Okay, so time for question and answers. Michelle, you're on, you're muted. Thank you. I guess that's the saying for 2020 and <laughs> 2021. Um, okay, um, so if you do have a question, please use the Q&A button, not the chat feature on the Zoom taskbar. We'll try to answer as many as we can in the time we have left. If we don't get through all of them, please send me an email message afterwards and I'll follow up with you. Okay, so the first question, uh, Drs. Halverson and Bailey, what's um, the relationship between poor sleep and mental health systems, um, symptoms? Are people not sleeping because of mental health symptoms or are they having mental health symptoms because they're not sleeping? And what are the implica implications of your answer for treatment 
of either condition? Well, I'll start, uh, Dr. Bailey, give you an opportunity to take a few breaths after your presentation. Um, you know, it's, a, it's an interesting question. We know that sleep and mental health uh, issues are, are tied uh, together. And in different cases, it, it might be one and it might be the other. So it's really important uh, to uh, be able to have your evaluation uh, with that, with that uh, person. Uh, you know, clearly, if you find uh, that you know, that anxiety uh, is keeping them up, they're ruminating, uh, you know, it's only particular days when, you know, the, when I have to go to the office the next day or, or I have a particular task or, or issue. I mean, it, 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 really, it really can vary. Um, but we do know when we look at, and we've certainly seen this, this has been known for a while, but we've, we've seen this uh, here at Rogers too, uh, people that have significant uh, risk of, of suicide or suicidal thoughts or dangerousness. Uh, one of the things that we always look at is how people are sleeping and uh, trying to do what we can to, to ameliorate sleep. And, and that is another thing when I said that, you know, we're, we're more aggressive uh, now during this pandemic, I am certainly very willing to give people medication to help them sleep uh, at, at this point, maybe even more so than, than usual, uh, just because how key sleep is to, to all of this. Thank you. Um, another question that we have is this. The data clearly suggests that systemic racism plays a role in greater rate of COVID-19 illnesses and deaths in minority communities. How is the factual issue addressed in the context of trying to help people from these communities with anxiety and de depressive sy symptoms they're having? I can offer some potential answer to that. Um, so the, the way I see it is that uh, as psychologists, we kind of have an ethical responsibility for ourselves. So starting with us being knowledgeable in continuing in our, our education about um, the effect of mental health on different um, communities and then also being culturally competent as providers. So I think that's that's where we could we have to start. Um, it's part of our ethical obligations. And then also looking at ways that we can offer our services to disenfranchised communities, whether that's you know um, providing services on a sliding scale, providing potentially pro bono services, um, looking into you know taking insurance uh, providers such as Medicare or Medicaid. Um, so that you are available to those communities as well. Yeah, I think access is, is important. And there are things that we can continue to do as, as uh, mental health professionals. I know we had, uh, again, talked about, you know, the obvious pieces of access, trying to be where people are, uh, trying to make sure folks understand that this is important and, and that we can help. But, uh, you know, I think it, it's an important uh it's very important uh, for us as healthcare providers, all healthcare providers, to look at ourselves and, and make sure that we're, uh, you know, offering uh, an environment um, that, is, that is attractive and welcoming to, to everybody. Uh, and I think that there's a lot of, uh, particularly, you know, we're struggling with this uh, in, you know, as, as a physician in the House of Medicine, there are a lot of things that we're doing, I would like to say, not, not purposefully, uh, some probably do it purposefully, but I think there's a lot of unconscious bias uh, that leads people to, to leads the, you know, these different populations to be less likely to come in uh, and seek the treatment that they need. Uh, so we really do have to continue to work on making sure that all of that stuff uh, in, in medicine is identified and, and rooted out. Um, and I think again, a lot of it is, I, I, would like to, I would like to hope that a lot of it is unconscious um, but continuing to talk about it, I know, and from our medical staff perspective, we are, you know, doing what we can uh, to make sure that, um, you know, that, that we're, that we're uh, being as, uh, as aware of, of everything that we're doing. Thank you. For our next question, uh, for on-site interventions to reduce burnouts, it is suggested a approach a universal one in which all employees are vigorously engaged to participate as a preventative measure? Or is it a more targeted approach better in which interventions are offered to those already exhibiting symptoms? Um, 
I like to think of it as an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. So if we can offer those uh, preventative measures and just build um, resilience among all of our employees and, you know, through physical activity or whatever it is, um, I think that's helpful. And I also think as um, a supervisor, I, it's helpful to monitor burnout among your, your staff and recognizing those who seem to be at risk and then offering more targeted discussion about that um, can be helpful as well. So I think it's, I think it's both. And I, I think it's, it's best for everybody to have kind of a, a wide encompassing approach to address burnout and then also uh, impactful for those who are demonstrating those symptoms to be addressed, at least in a supportive supervision. I'm just going to, I'm just going to add on to that a little bit. I mean, one of the, the benefits is, is not only, you know, getting it early and, and, and giving people skills and, and helping prevent, but also it helps set a culture. It helps set a conversation. Uh, if as a system, you are talking about that, you're engaging people in that people know that it's maybe a safer environment to be able to talk about, you know, one of the slides that I showed is just kind of how hesitant, particularly in this pandemic environment, how hesitant people are to talk to others uh, at work. Uh, and uh, part of that is, is that you have to have a culture that's accepting and, you know, we don't want everybody to go and tell their, tell everybody there, hey, I'm, I'm struggling with this and that, and, you know, but it, it, it shouldn't be as much of a stigmatizing secret uh, as it oftentimes is right now. And, and, and if you have a well-meaning, forward-leaning, forward-thinking uh, workplace that is engaging uh, any of that kind of thing, that's a really good thing that we should support. Thank you. I think we have time for one more um, question. It says, BA appears to be focused on maintaining functioning and increasing positive reinforcement. What approach is taken, taken in BA to address addressing negative thoughts? I'm gonna leave that to BB. <laughs> um, so the approach from a, a purely behavioral activation standpoint is that thoughts um, are important in that they can, even if you're doing something enjoyable, you can be stuck ruminating about all of the terrible, awful things that are happening in this moment. And I think all of us have experienced that in this climate of the pandemic. Um, and so the approach from a behavioral activation standpoint is to use mindfulness to refocus and kind of remove yourself from that problematic thought process and getting stuck in those thoughts and that rumination and pulling you back into the moment of what you're doing. Um, and that is challenging, especially because a lot of people have spent a lot of time stuck in that process and it is their nature at this point. And so uh, it's a muscle that you have to build over time. And the more that you try it and the more that effort you put into it and it is arduous at first, um, the, there are exceeding benefits of using mindfulness to combat that negative thinking. Thank you. Well, I just want to thank you again, Drs. Bailey and Halverson, for taking the time away from your clinical practice to share your valuable insights with us. Helping a patient on the road to recovery means collaboration among everyone involved in their treatment. With locations across the country, our treatment teams are ready to partner with you. Rogers Outreach representatives are happy to answer any questions regarding our treatment services, as well as learn more about your practice. Okay, and this was the last slide. I'm going to just um, verify. Let me see. There was one just for takeaways, um, but it's included in the handout too, just so you know, it's, it's uh, pandemics had a lot of psychological sequelae on people and we're seeing a lot of increases in psychological concerns. So um, the workplace has changed drastically and we see a lot of people uh, experiencing a lot of stress in that environment that can uh, become more robust into other contexts in their you know, adapting our empirically supported treatments can be helpful in addressing anxiety, depression, and burnout among those who are really stressed at this time. Okay, thank you so much. And that about wraps it up, everyone. I want to remind our participants that those of you who met the requ time required commitment will be eligible for CE credits. About 30 minutes after the webinar ends, you will receive an email with a link to the mandatory evaluation form. Once you complete it, you may download your CE certificate for the event. 
You will also be able to access PDFs of the PowerPoint uh, presentation slides handout and a complete list of references. On behalf of everyone at Rogers, we look forward to partnering with you to help you support your patients. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great day, everybody. Thanks.